Okay, let me share my screen. Yeah, um, yeah, so I hope you all can share my screen. Uh, welcome to Multimodal Weekly. This is the uh, weekly webinar series hosted by the team here um, at Tor Labs. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Tor Labs, we are an early stage AI startup uh, focused on building multimodal uh, foundation models for video understanding. Um, and this webinar is part of our initiatives to you know gather uh, practitioners, including you know, researchers, developers, founders, entrepreneurs, um, who are excited about yeah, the future of multimodal AI. Um, and we've been meeting every Friday uh, over the past one and a half years, actually. Here's some of the topics that we tend to cover on a weekly basis. Uh, obviously, researchers can talk about their work in you know, multimodal AI for these models. Uh, we'll have developers talk about different in innovative applications that they build, uh, different projects that, that they like to share. Uh, sometimes startup father talk about the startup in this space as well. And occasionally, we have uh, uh, you know, internal team, team members and uh, our partners are sharing tutorials and guys and how we use our platform and API. Uh, in some of the, uh, you know, recent session of webinar, we have a, a wide ranging of speakers and, uh, you know, people talk about different areas ranging from, uh, you know, video, um, like foundation model of computer vision to, you know, multimodal intelligence, video QA, uh, you know, at the search, uh, video instruction tuning, uh, benchmark evaluation for multimodal AI, right? So I think there's a lot of experiments going on in the field. For this week's session, uh, we have like three very exciting presentation um, from, you know, um, I guess like grad student and researchers working on different areas of multimodal and video. So uh, the first group will be Jacob, Chuck, and Jason Hong. Uh, I think they're calling from the UK. So appreciate you guys for making the time to join today. And I know it's pretty uh, late in the afternoon on, on Friday for you guys. But they will talk about their work called Tim, a term in the book machine for audio visual action recognition. So that's be the first talk. And then the second talk will come from Haran Rajesh and Navin Reddy. Um, they uh, will talk about their work uh, called MI Cup, a unified model for identity aware movie description. Um, uh, so they, I think I believe they was part of like you know IIT Hyderabad, and actually that's also the same uh, origin of the third presenter as well, which is Aditya Kumar Singh and the uh, Srivastava, um, also working um, you know in in the domain of video and and movie understanding. Especially they were talking about their research on um, leveraging TV episode recaps to you know summarize. Uh, the, the part of the, the story, the movies, if I'm correct, but you know, we can definitely excited to like learn more about that and discuss much more of that in in details. Yeah, so that's the high level description about the agenda I think that today. Each talk will be roughly between fifteen plus minutes uh, with an additional of two three minutes Q and A. Um, so with that, uh, for uh, the attendees, um, participants in, in the Zoom, feel free to send your question on the chat, and then I surface that to the speakers. Uh, you know, once they finish. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I unmute Jacob and Jason so that you can share your screen and start with your presentation. Okay, so I'll just share it here. Hopefully, hopefully that's visible. So that... Yep, I'm seeing it. Awesome. Okay, cool. So yeah, hello, I'm Jacob. I'm with the University of Bristol, pretty much in my final year of my PhD now, supervised by Professor Demon Damon. So working mainly on audiovisual stuff, kind of applied to egocentric video understanding. Um, and yeah, Jason, I guess if you want to do do yours now. I can mute it, Jason. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford. I'm collaborating with Jacob and also Dima's group. And I'm also very happy to present this our work in this seminar. But to be honest, like I'm in Korea, so it's like two two o'clock in the morning. So I mostly like Jacob will talk mostly about it because I'm like in like not in a like, I might 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 be like getting to sleep during my presentation. So like I asked yeah, Jacob. Spare Jason. Yeah. Spare Jason the two AM presenting. So I'm happy to like take any like Q and A's after this presentation. Okay, yeah, so we're going to be presenting our um, CVPR work from this year. So Tim, a time interval machine for 
audio visual action recognition. So this was a collaboration between the University of Bristol, the VGD group in Oxford, and also Czech Technical University in Prague with our collaborator, um, Van Gellis. So just to kind of start things off, um, we're just going to kind of give like a quick preliminary of sort of like um, recent work regarding audiovisual labels. So sort of up, up until recently, most audiovisual methods kind of trained like video understanding tasks on these kind of typically visually biased and visually driven labels only. So the timestamps were kind of like visually driven as well as the semantics, but this has quite a few like erroneous assum assumptions, such as with the closed bin example, visually that's from when the bin is falling, closing, and then slamming shut. But in audio, that's just that sort of like snap sound at the end. So there's like a difference in timestamps. And then you also use kind of like different semantics to describe the same event between audio and visual. Um, so recent work such as Epic Sounds and the perception tests kind of give the audio modality a bit more of an accurate representation of itself by introducing modality or audio specific timestamps and audio specific semantics as well. So this work kind of looks into um, sort of taking advantage of this as well by training on these two label sets jointly. Um, and also as well with current recognition approaches. So say we're interested in the wash tomato action here. Uh, we would like sort of look at the exact timestamps um, of this action, take a subset of frames within the start and end time, then feed it through some visual backbone. And then we try and get this to recognize the ongoing action. Equally, if we wanted to incorporate context, this is typically done in the form of uh, neighboring actions, again, with exact label timestamps where you know where these exact labels are. So you take frames from these sort of time regions, feed it into your model as well. And this can kind of give a boost in performance because you have a view of the ongoing context. But these kind of approaches kind of fail to take advantage of the what we call like the genuine context. So all of this red section here, this isn't being passed into the model at all. Um, most works kind of focus on these exact labeled regions, whereas we would like to sort of take advantage of the true surrounding context of a, of an action. And so this is where we would introduce Tim. So if we had this long untrimmed audiovisual input, we would then be interested in a particular timestamp. So this could be an exact region of an action that happens within this long audiovisual input. We would take the start and end time of this action, as well as the like encompassing modality. So whether this is a visual action or an audio action, and then we would find a way to encode this into some d-dimensional vector to represent that time interval. Um, and this would give us an encoded query. This, along with the audiovisual input as well, gets fed into a transformer encoder. And then Tim is able to output the visual or auditory action that occurs within that specific time interval within that modality. So again, sort of a bit more of a, a, a look into this here. So say in this uh, 20 second input, we're interested in the action that happens between three to five seconds in the visual modality. We would encode this time interval, feed it to Tim, and it would be able to tell us that rinse sponge is happening here. Then within the exact same input, if we now just change the time interval query that we're looking at, as well as the modality, um, so now we'll say zero to five seconds in audio, Tim would be able to change its output to water. And we can kind of keep changing the query to whichever ground truth timestamp we'd like in recognition. And Tim is able to update its prediction based on the fed in interval query. But importantly, this is using the exact same long 20 second input we're just changing the query and Tim is able to update its output based on what timestamp we're most interested in. So a bit more of a full picture of how we do this um, in practice. So if we had like a, an, a long um, input, it's five seconds here for visualization, but imagine this is up to 30 seconds or like longer. So we would take a pre-trained visual and audio encoder and extract dense overlapping one second features. Um, and we would then have like a, a feature representation of this input in both audio and visual. We would then take the time stamps that we're interested in, so the in recognition, the ground truth actions, and we'd feed them through this time interval MLP, which basically encodes the time modality that we'd like to query. We then get a d-dimensional vector encoding of this time interval, which we will then do channel-wise concatenation to the CLS tokens. Um, so which we can later pass through some classifier heads to be able to tell us what the actions are happening within that query timestamp. But importantly as well, our pre-extracted features on earlier, they also span a time interval themselves. 
So we need to feed in the, those time intervals to our time interval MLP, and then also concatenate them to the input features so that the model knows what these input features represents in terms of time. There's sort of this notion of relative position within in the video. And then as well, we also have a modality encoding just so we can distinguish between visual and auditory tokens. And then that forms our input sequence to the transformer. So now this is ready to pass through our audio visual transformer. Uh, it's just an encoder model here. Um, it will then go through all of the subsequent layers. And then at the end, we take the final output representation of the CLS token, pass it through some classifier heads, and Tim's basically able to say what class is going on um, based on a, a softmax tool. So looking a bit more specifically into how we encode these time intervals. Um, so we would form a two-dimensional vector based on the start and end time. Um, and then we feed it through this MLP. So we have a two to D-dimensional layer. Um, then D-dimensional, we do this for a few times. And eventually, we'll output a D-dimensional vector encoding for that time interval. And this is done um, simultaneously. So all of our uh, time intervals will go through at once to give this kind of notion of universal time. Um, and it's important that the time intervals are kind of relative to each other so that it's consistent and then it knows sort of what 0 0.5 to 1.2 seconds actually means within the within the input. So now we've just got like a few qualitative examples here. I'm hoping the sound is working. Um, so this is just like a, an example 30 second input in Epic Kitchens. Uh, so we'd have the full input and we can see what Tim will output based on its, um, on these different queries. So again, this is just the same input all that's changing are these different CLS tokens and time intervals. And we can see the different predictions both in audio and visual. There we go, that's just um, one such example from Epic Kitchens there. So now, yeah, then we go into the recognition results. So we have our visual only version of Tim, um, sort of at the bottom there, and we can see that even just without the audio modality, if we just focus on vision, we're still getting very strong performance, kind of giving credit to this query and mechanism, showing how it is able to distinguish between different actions based on the fed in input time. Um, and then it's, it's taken advantage of the surrounding contacts, co context. And then obviously when we feed in the audio modality, this gives a bo boost to performance as well. Um, similarly, we do the same for Epic Sounds. So this is audio recognition based on sounds. Uh, we state the art performance there. Um, we did the same for the perception test data set. So this is a data set that also has distinct visual and audio labels. Um, the base challenges are on localization, but we kind of just take their validation set and create a, a recognition challenge where we know where the actions are happening. We don't have to try and regress to them also. And then finally, we have um, AVE, which is an audio visual segmentation data set. So here we're just querying zero to one seconds, one to two seconds, and we're trying to distinguish between a specific class or whether it's background. And then naturally, Tim can extend itself into detection. So let's now remove the assumption that we know where the timestamps is are or where the actions are happening in recognition. And instead, we're trying to detect them. We're also trying to localize where they are in this input as well. So there's two main additions that we have to this. The first is the regression head. So now, instead of just trying to classify these CLS tokens, we're also feeding them into a regression head, which is going to output a time interval where it thinks the action is more aligned. So in this example, we query zero to four seconds and the regression head is saying, actually, this action is more aligned between one to four seconds, for example. And then we also construct a query pyramid. So in recognition, we know where the actions are happening. We have those ground truth timestamps, but in detection, we don't have such an assumption. So essentially, we're just going to densely query the input itself at multiple different scales to be able to regress to different actions. So we start with um, sort of dense short term and then sort of less dense, uh, longer query sort of in larger in size. And then we do that up until a certain, some certain depth of the pyramid. And then in training, we'll take this query py pyramid and we will label them based on IOU with the ground truth. So this way we're able to distinguish between overlapping actions of different sizes um, sort of the shorter queries are going to regress to the, the more shorter actions because they'll have a larger IOU. Um, and then similarly with the longer ones, we'll be going to the longer actions. And again, we just sort of show that this gives strong results. So we, we out, managed to outperform and actually form a baseline on Epic Kitchens, um, as well as the perception test, um, as, as well as when we're using the same set of features.
and I guess sort of like got a few minutes now. So we analyze these time intervals as well. So this is an attention heat map of the second layer of the transformer encoder. So on the y-axis, we have different time interval queries that we'd like to, to look at. And then on the bottom is the, the, in, the, in, the overlapping input features that we fed in. And we can see from this that based on the query that we're feeding in, the model is attending to the features that are within that time interval query. So specifically for the 10 to 26 action, you can see the attention is mainly going to those features that are between 10 to 26 seconds. And then the attention maps are for two different windows. So we show that it's consistent across different input windows. And similarly, we have a really, this is a really dense TSNE. So there's just a lot of points on here uh, for all of these continuous time intervals. And we can see that Tim basically has a sensible encoding of time. So if we look at the top left there for Epic, on the left-hand side is a duration of the queries uh, of the uh, yeah, time intervals. So on the left are sort of all of the short, all of the short-term queries that span between like zero to 0 0.1 up, up until 19.9 .9 to 20 seconds. And then as we go further right, we're seeing that the model is sort of embedding these into space in, in a sensible manner that the longer queries go more to the right. And there's like a, a sensible structure there within this TSNE plot. Um, and we do the same across all three different data sets for the three aspects of a time interval, which is the start time, the end time, and the duration. And then just sort of some final analysis on this as well is that we show that when we permute or shift uh, the time intervals away from the ground truth during recognition, um, we do see a, full, a sort of a drop off on performance, which is expected. Again, this is reinforcing the fact that the model is accurately learning these time intervals. And when you're permuting your query away from the, the ground truth timestamp, it's it's now not looking at the, the correct part of the input. And so obviously performance is going to drop from this. So this is kind of reaffirming that the time interval is going to the correct points in the videos and that it's sort of learning um this universal time and it's sort of like a final ablation that we have here is um comparing it to the sort of more traditional positional encodings like a learned or sinusoidal um these type of positional encodings naturally kind of struggle in this environment because you're saying you have this long input um and then you're just concatenating a cls token at the end but the cls token doesn't really necessarily know where it's happening within that input you're just saying it's position like n um, whereas with the time interval queries, we can kind of guide specifically within that input where to attend to. Um, and yeah, so this is kind of the, the benefit we have over some more traditional positional encodings. Um, yeah, and so finally, if you're interested in more, the code is released. Um, so if you go to uh, Jacob Chalk slash Tim on GitHub, this is where we have our recognition detection and feature extractions. Um, and then also you can just look at the QR code and uh, visit any sort of relevant links here. Yeah, thank you very much for listening. And um, yeah, happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Jacob. Uh, so I just put the GitHub link to the chat as well. Uh, or probably just bear it quickly. Um, yeah. Um, is there any question for, for Jacob uh, with respect to the talk? If you do, just put on the chat or you can just raise your hand and I can, uh, I can unmute you. Maybe one, one question from my end is, um, I know you play around with like three data set, right? For, for this specific, like applications, perception tests and AVE, right? Um, in order to extend this work, like what are the sort of data domain that you, you think it might be interesting to, you know, evaluate the models on? Yeah, so I guess with Tim, it's it's temporal in nature, right? So you can kind of, any task that involves some sort of temporal element, you could try and extend it to. So um, I guess you could try and extend Tim into like a, a VQA type setting. Um, so mm -hmm. I guess with like detection recognition, it's called close set, small vocabulary. We could try and look at extending a more open vocabulary type of Tim. Um, again, where we're trying to find within these long inputs where certain events are happening, but we're less constrained to a, a fixed vocabulary size. That would be, I think, an interesting extension of, of Tim 
It's just going into different types of temporal uh, challenges. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, if there's no, like, immediate question from the participants, uh, yeah, we can probably uh, stop the first, move on to the second speakers. If, and if you have more questions about him for, for Jacob and Jason, just put on the chat and they can um, respond to it asynchronously throughout the, you know, the webinar um, period, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Jacob. Very, very exciting work. Um, so yeah, if you don't mind stop sharing your screen, I will unmute Naveen and Haran. So you guys can yeah, talk about MIK. Yeah. Let me just share my screen. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So today we'll be presenting uh, MeCap, a unified model for identity aware movie descriptions. Uh, so this is joint work by uh, Haran Rajesh, uh, Zishan Khan, Makaran Tapasvi, and me, Naveen. Uh, this was presented at CVPR 2024. And so, a quick intro about ourselves. So I work as a machine learning lead at uh, Sensora and uh, I mostly work on video understanding for media focused on movies and TV shows and also I'm a part-time research assistant at uh, IIIT Hyderabad where I uh, worked on this project along with Haran. So Haran, you can introduce yourself too. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, uh, I'm a full-time research student at yeah, to fight the thoughts where I'm where I'm advised by Professor Mukherjee philosophy. I'm also currently working with uh, Gul Viral from EMPC Paris and Andrew Wiseman from VGG Oxford on sign language translation. So yeah, very excited to give this talk and yeah, let, let me start with that. Yeah. So uh, we mentioned our movie descriptions, right? So what movie descriptions are we focusing on? So uh, we mainly mainly focus on audio descriptions. Uh, so what are audio descriptions? So basically, audio uh, descriptions help visually impaired people understand what is happening in the movie better. So this, they describe what uh, actions are taking place, the background, the setup, and other factors. So to just give you an idea of what audio descriptions are, let me just play this video. Just watch the movie and close your eyes. I hope you're able to listen to the audio. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can hear well, in most movies, we just listening. Yeah, who's that? What's going on? Police lights flash on the front of the buyer's house as Officer Callahan stands outside with Joyce and Jonathan. The audio description is a description of the action that's going on in between the dialogue. Inside the dark house, Hopper walks down the hallway with. Yeah. So basically, this is the audio description uh, that ha that gets played uh, in between dialogues to explain what is happening and the visually impaired people can understand uh, the movie better. Okay. Yeah, so, so for example, on Netflix, you have this AD tag for movies and uh, you can enable it to get these audio descriptions on. So what is uh, identity aware captioning? So basically, uh, it's a form in which you describe what is happening in the video along with the identity being taken into account. So the identity of the characters is captured across video clips and uh, you describe what is happening along with the identities being considered. So for example, here, uh, the person one and person two identities are captured in this description. Uh, so in prior work, uh, in video understanding, the main focus was more on uh, captioning and uh, explaining what is happening in the video. And the identity was not uh, pretty much focused on. So for example, previous captioning methods would caption something like someone pulls up in her convertible and someone gets in. 
so the identity wouldn't be captured much uh, and it was more about just describing what is happening in the video but recent work like embed names mad uh, lsmd see take this into account and uh, provide identity aware video captions as well so mad and embed names uh, focus more uh, i mean they provide the ground truth character names but LMC, lsmdc on the other hand uh, gives local character ids across video clips so our work focuses on the LMC, lsmdc data set and uh, I'll explain what that is. So LSMTC is large scale movie description challenge and it consists of two tasks. Uh, the first is the fill in the blank task where you have descriptions in this format and you have blanks. And the goal is to fill these blanks uh, to explain, uh, fill these blanks with the person IDs. And there is another task called full captioning where you provide the caption along with the person IDs. So our goal, our work is a joint model, which does both of these tasks, both the description and the captioning. Um, so to give you an idea of how uh, the examples in the data set are, I'm just giving you a quick short video. So you can see uh, there are a lot of short changes. There's quick action, a lot of characters. Yeah, so this problem is pretty challenging in terms of getting the identities right across videos where it could be dark scenes. The Sometimes the characters are not even present and you will have to describe uh, their actions. So, so we say MECAP, right? So MECAP stands for Movie Identity Captioner. And uh, this is a quick overview of our architecture and we'll dive deeper into, deeper into each of these modules. So we have a transformer encoder block and a decoder block. And um, we um, we extract various features from the video and pass these uh, as captioning memory through the encoder. And this is further passed to the decoder for both the tasks, which we jointly train, uh, which is the fill in the blank task and the full captioning task. So let me just dive deeper into this and uh, so uh, the first step is the feature extraction stage. Uh, so we have both the text features and the visual features. Uh, for the text features, uh, we need this for the fill in the blank task. Um, so we pass this through BERT and we extract the blank embeddings and the blank e embeddings act as the features. And for the visual features, we uh, uh, pick I3D features trained on uh, kinetics 400 data set and these are the action features and for the face features we take arc face features and for uh, for semantic understanding we take the clip features now you have these features from different modalities so how do we combine all of this so uh, this is how we create the captioning memory so we have these different uh, tokens and uh, we project them into a common embedding dimension space and we add additional embeddings um, like the type embedding and the uh, video IDs kind of uh, time embedding. And for the action features, we again give the type and the video and segment embedding. These are the time embeddings. And for the face features, we add uh, all these again, along with cluster ID, uh, like the face features are clustered using DB scan and the IDs are passed along with the bounding box information. And the clip features, we again pass the type and the video and uh, segment embeddings, which represent time embeddings. So uh, all these are then combined and passed to the transformer encoder. So what we've noticed is adding these additional uh, embeddings um, for each of these different modalities helps the model learn better the individual modalities and also uh, help the model um, for the task of um, the fill in the blanks and as well as the full caption. So over to the decoder, we have uh, a dual setup here. So first is the uh, transformer decoder for the fill in the blank task. So here you have all the features from the previous step and uh, so here we autoregressively predict only the 
identities, the identity tokens, whereas the caption is passed as is. So you can see only P1 and P2, uh, the person ID tokens are predicted. Um, so in the other setup, uh, for the full captioning, we don't pass the text features. Uh, and we auto recursively predict both the character identity tokens and the uh, caption tokens. So you can see we predict both uh, the character and the identity tokens and the caption token together. And both are uh, trained in a joint fashion and the parameters are shared together for both of these steps. Yeah. So over to Haran, uh, who will explain the iSpice metric. And there's a new metric we propose. Um, yeah, over to you, Haran. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tommy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I hope you guys can see the transfer school bridge behind me, like the golden bridge, I think, I'm not sure. But yeah, so just thought I'd you know, add some home feeling. Yeah, anyway, so, uh, like we this this paper is in the identity aware captioning and we believe it's an under researched field and one of the reasons why we think so is because we don't have a metric that can actually predict how well a model is predicting I mean how is the model doing on the identities you know in a movie or in a caption setting so because current metrics or captioning metrics focus on like end gram matching or word to word matching. So it isn't able to specifically single out identities and say, hey, a model is doing well on identities or something else. So to this end, we propose the iSpice metric. So it takes in two captions, the reference in the, uh, the reference in the ground truth, as I reference on the candidate caption. And then from, from these two captions, we obtain a scene graph. And from these scene graphs, we extract tuples. So it's like you can see P1, P1 is on a couch and so on. And earlier work, which is Spice, takes the F1 over uh, F1 scores the overlap of these two lists and gives and that's the score spice reports. We build on top of this by X uh, only using the tuple that have an identity in them and removing all the other tuples and further splitting the two groups. One where only the ID is present, and the second where it's the ID plus any other word, an action word, and so on. And we get the F1 of the overlap of both of these different lists, multiply them, and report that as our score. So in our in so in our understanding, the first term will tell you whether the model understands what which characters are in the scene or not, and secondly, the second term it is uh, helps us to understand whether the model can actually uh, know, actually knows which character is doing what throughout the scene. So uh, yeah, and yeah, so just some results as an NEC UPR paper these days. Unfortunately, you have to get sort of performance. So we have sort of performance on both tasks in both capturing metrics and filling the blank metrics. And then in the next slide. So yeah, we have a bunch of results as well. You can look at the, and we encourage you guys to look at the paper and read the paper and so on. But one thing we, we were really happy to see was that our model was able to look at, was to distinguish between different modalities and figure out which, in, which modality give importance to in different situations. So as you can see here, we, um, our, we consider the, our caption to have two different types of tokens, the person token, which is the ID label P1, P2, and so on, and the caption token, which has basically not all the non-identity tokens that's in the caption. And we, here we see that the, uh, these attention maps show us that when the model predicts a person token in the caption, it looks more at the face features as compared to the action features. And for caption tokens, it looks more to action features as compared to the face features, which actually intuitively makes sense because when you're predicting a person token, you want identity information which the face ha which face features have. And when you're trying to generate other tokens like walking and so on, you would look more at the you know at the feature that would explain what, what actions are happening in the scene. So it was, it's, re it's really cool to see that our model was not only able to uh, leverage the different modalities well, but it was also able to figure out which modality give importance to different situations. And finally, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks for listening to the talk. You can, um, you, to know more, please visit our project webpage. Like, thanks to James for setting this up. And mm -hmm. yeah, we'll be happy to take any questions. Awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Ryan, for closing it out. Uh, I'll put the link of the project to the Zoom chat as well. So, yeah, people can take a look and, and idea a bit deeper. And, um,
No, not a question. Let Marco said, love it. Yeah, and thanks, Marco. So, so, clap from Ankush. So, I think that those are positive reactions. Oh, Jason had a question. Uh, I unmute you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the talk. I have a question question about like like general like task of this one. I think so. I think for like generating the caption, I think we need to do two things. One is like generating the cash caption itself, but another thing is like how to place this this caption in the middle of like the movie. Is there any like like the like the model or like the meta you're considering to place these captions in the in the movies? Like how do you how do you place so these I guess so I think you're asking whether where like predict where an audio description should take place. I think that's what you're asking. Sorry. Uh, I think you're asking like how do you predict where an audio description should be? Yes, 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 right? yes. Okay, so yeah, so in this particular, uh, in this particular work, the LSMBC data set, it it only it, it we don't have access to the entire movie end to end. We only have access to the clips where an audio description should take place. Mm. So that's not the work, but. I think since we, I believe you're from VGG, so I think Auto eighty two did some work on this, like from where they, I think they trained a simple, like binary classifier to predict whether in this time in this time frame, uh, throughout the movie whether there should be an audio description here or not, and I think mm -hmm. that did decently well, but like yeah, but that's definitely a, a place to look at. Mm -hmm. like we have in this work we haven't done it. Do do we even like tra train such like binary classifiers? Seems like like if there's a silence, we can just place the caption like every like silence, isn't it? Uh, I think it depends on the length as well because if there's a, if there's um if there's only like a one two second gap, can you, can you fit an audio description in there? Uh, okay. And also, is it necessary at times? So mm -hmm. it's like and even even if there's like a five second thing, how much do you like? How much do you, how long is the audio description? How far back do you go? So I think there's a lot of intricacies even then. But, but that's still top of my head. I'm sure there's people who've done more research on that. Yeah, you should check out uh, Auto AD two and three, and they focus on where to place these captions as yeah. well. And they out. It's, it's Andrew's work actually. I think yeah, so. You could just ask. Yes. Him. Yep. Um. Awesome. Uh, I so Nico, I think you got you got your hands on for a while. Do you, I, I mute you? I see. Oh, he he hasn't unmuted himself yet. So maybe you can just go over the other question on the Zoom chat. So, Rash Rashi got a question. If you can read it, do you also describe the audio within the video, for example, the background music information like clapping, child crying, etc.? Uh, so yes. So, yeah, go on, I don't take it. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of uh, like audio, there's no speech in the clips we have because it's in places where our description should take place. But in terms of uh background music information, I think clapping would be a, like. I'm not sure you have an example, but like clapping is definitely something that should be part of the description. And then, but the background music, uh, that, yeah, actually, yeah, you want, yeah, actually, anonymous background music, yeah, the, it definitely would be a part of our descriptions. So, like, our, our descriptions in general does would include stuff like this. Whether it has, whether we have examples of that, I would have to look through. I don't know if you have one on it right now. So I'd like to add, so the, the audio descript audio within the video, I think like these, um, so the, it's, these captions are audio descriptions are mainly for visually impaired, right? So it's more about describing what is happening visually in the video. And, uh, I think it's like clapping and child crying. I think they'll be able to hear that. So it's more about visually describing, uh, what is happening in the video. Yep. I mean, if you leverage the the team project, I guess you can do both visual and audio, right? At the same time. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, and uh, Michael got those two questions, if you want to answer them quickly. First question is, do you have an understanding of scene start and end time based on 
storytelling style of scene? Uh, so in the LM LSMDC data set we, uh, we have, there are clips which we work with. So in the sense, they're already uh, grouped into small, small scenes. So um, yeah, in the sense, we don't work with the whole movies and we work with small clips. And these already have like an understanding of a scene for that matter. But as you said, if you're working with a larger movie, it makes sense to use scenes. Yeah. And then maybe just one last question in the interest of time, because we still got one more presentation. Uh let's take um Jacob question. Are you able to generate any sort of reasoning for actions between in the caption? I think Harun, you can take this. Yeah, so I think I uh, exactly gave P1. So it would depend again so this like Naveen said it would, it's for visually impaired individuals so it's the goal of these kind of captions is to allow them to basically you should be able to watch a movie blind like with with your eyes closed basically so if uh if, if in your example p1 faces p2 because to do something if the next scene would have that person doing that thing and, and he could hear it or maybe to say something then it would be just p1 faces p2 and then you would hear P1 say whatever he wants to P2. So I guess it would depend on the context. So usually if it's if the if the script is or like the the character's uh, audio is gonna explain what's gonna why he's gonna do that, it wouldn't be in the in the movie in the audio description. It's ideally it just happen it's just to describe what's happening visually in that scene, not to say, not to get under the reasoning behind these sort of things. So, yeah, I think that's that's, that's a, yep, great. But yeah, if, if there are any more questions, yeah, you can just ask on the Discord channel. Yep. Yeah, Discord. feel free to uh, ping us if you have any questions later on. We can take it. Awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah so now we put in my stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So I unmute Aditya and the roof, so you guys can go ahead. Yeah. Am I audible? Yep, I can hear. Yeah. I think my screen is visible. Yeah, I saw the AMD together with advanced screen. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, that's all together a lot of information to process like from all the talks, uh, very nice talks. And uh, I'll try to make it super quick. So hello, I am Aditya. Uh, I'm currently an ML engineer at AMD and I have been with Triple Light Hyderabad working in Sibet lab along with Makaran Tapaswi and my colleague Dhruv Sivastar. Dhruv, can you unmute and introduce yourself? Hello everyone, I'm Thruf and I'm a research associate at Adobe. And as Aditya said, this was a collaborative effort with him and Professor Makaran Tapaswi at Triple IP Hyderabad. Yeah, thank you, Dhruv. So let's carry on. So what's our problem statement? So our goal is uh, given an episode, we are trying to predict a story summary. And now that's a multimodal form of story summary having both video and dialogues. Now, uh, before going uh, forward to uh, what we are going to do, so what's the key idea is, uh, uh, first of all, what is story summary and how we are obtaining it? The story summary can be thought of as uncut segments in an episode of a TV show, which when stitched together, will give you enough context to uh, recall if you have seen the whole episode, right? So this is what we define as story summary. Now to obtain this, we, use recap as a supervising signal. Now recap usually defined as a short video sequence that is shown at the beginning of an episode and consists of key story moments, right? And uh, why we need this, right? So existing works in video summarization uh, formulated this task as extracting point summaries. For example, thumbnail extraction, video storyboards, 
and retrieving key action or event uh, in a, a given video, right? So, and supporting this task, uh, there are a lot of data sets. Uh, the first one being TVSum with 50 videos, each lasting one to 11 minutes. Uh, Summy, and then for text, we have news articles uh, like from CNN Daily Mail, tripod data set with movie plots and instructional live stream videos uh, as we see in Bliss. And closest to our task is some screen 3D, uh, which however try to generate text summaries. Uh, now, uh, this is actually in a long, very long video, but they try to take uh, multimodal input and uh, generate text summaries for the given ep episode. Now the limitations, like except few in text domain as we see, uh, all the tasks are shown summarization at like low level details. The potential of using like multiple modalities that may complement each other is like still unexplored. Hence, uh, first of all, we introduce plot snap, our data set uh, to uh, go into this uh, domain of uh, processing long videos as well as extracting story summaries. So uh, PlotSnap consists of two popular American crime thriller TV shows, 24 and Prison Bed. And uh, feature-wise, it is either side multimodal, meaning that the inputs as well as the outputs are multimodal, where we have uh, ground truth labels for both video and text. Now, along with multiple keys to uh, like the, the each episode consists of multiple key story segments, unlike uh, um, uh, five to ten minutes video, which we are where we are only focusing on like. Uh, uh, one or more, most likely two uh, key segments. And uh, these videos are like insanely long, like from 40 to 45 minutes and total of 114 hour, 149 hours long, the whole data set. And for more details, you can uh, refer to our paper. So now, uh, how do we construct this story summary labels? So there are two processes involved. One is matching and uh, then smoothing. So what is matching? Matching is basically like I'm, I'll go on a high level overview, the technical details we can go and read into the paper. So given a shot of a recap, we try to match with the episode and wherever this shot have a maximum overlap with the shot in the episode, we'll pick that out. So that's how we construct the labels. Then in smoothing, uh, we extend our supervision like uh, here, uh, as per the recap content, you can see we have two shots side by side n and n plus two, but then plus one is not that relevant and is not selected by matching algorithm. So uh, due to, so this is called short thread patterns. You can uh, get more info in here. Uh, one recap shot may match multiple shots, uh, but not selecting the non-match shots as we see in this thread could, uh, uh, could conflict like could uh, generate conflicting signals to the model, which is learning to try learning to extract the sub story. So this conflict is to avoid this conflicting signal. We include this short n plus one uh, to supervise model to capture this story element, right? Uh, next, moving on to our approach for story summarization, uh, we introduce a tail sum that is a two level hierarchical transformer model and uh, that is uh, uh, trying to identify sub stories in a tv episode so starting with label one we extract video sort embedding uh, from its constituent raw frame embeddings now these frame embeddings uh, how do we uh, generate we have visual backbones like mvit clip dense net obviously frozen and uh, we obtain these features and uh, try to fuse them in a very special manner and uh, after uh, after this fusion, we pass all these fused features into a short level encoder, where we do CLS pooling to get short level embedding. For dialogue part, again, we take a uh, uh, fine tuned robot and uh, pass uh, word tokens and do average pooling to get the whole sentence embedding. Uh, by the way, these dialogues are the direct text from the .srt files. Now, uh, our overview, like uh, what we do, the further pre-processing with all these tokens so obtained, we temporarily arrange 
temporarily arrange these visual tokens and uh, group them in size of 20 along with their coexisting utterance tokens to form for local story group right um i don't know why my pointer is not showing sorry um okay yeah it's here so um here we are uh another token uh other tokens like modality type embeddings, absolute time embeddings, and group ID, basically to which group it is belonging. And uh, at the end, uh, we are also adding something called group token. And now, what is this group token uh, and uh, how it is helpful? We'll discuss this later. So why this group structure? So this group structure is assumed to give something called scene structure, as well as enable efficient message passing. Uh, which we'll uh, see later how it is doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that in a way, actually reducing the noise from all these short as well as utterance embedding. So it's kind of uh, condensing the information in a hierarchical manner. Now with all that being done, uh, like these are the like video group token. So it may happen that the dialogue may be absent, right? The video signal is continuous, but the dialogue is not, it is sparse. So just uh, for uh, illustration purpose, we uh, uh, put it out. And uh, this is the group token. And uh, that this is the level two where we pass the group tokens through a six layer transformer encoder uh, that is decorated with a special form of block attention. Now to understand this block attention. So here, as you can see, each shaded diagonal block uh, represents an interaction zone for the local story groups like this red part. So first one is for this, second one for this, and so on and so forth, right? Next, this purple box uh, denotes the location of the group token. And this purple box denotes the interaction across these group tokens. And the off diagonal uh, uh, purple box, uh, as we said, is uh, the interactions. And this continues for all six layers of transformer encoder. This allows efficient message passing because it is not attending to everyone. It's kind of like window attention, not exactly window attention, kind of window attention, and uh, thereby reducing noise and improves computational efficiency. And at the end, uh, we pass the predictions from the uh, uh, transformer corresponding to the video and dialogue to a linear classifier. And so here are some experiments. Uh, so first we have uh, architecture ablations uh, where our metric is AP. Here we compare our uh, spatial attention against the full attention along with uh, switching off or on group token. As evident, the proposed approach in row six, that is the sparse attention, uh, performs best for both modalities. On both, uh, next we compare SOTA methods like video only and dialogue only. Uh, while none of the above methods are built for processing like 40 minutes of video, we just add up them for our task. On both the validation and test set, uh, is there any questions? And... Okay. Oh, uh, no. Okay. I think it's people. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> on both the validation and test set, uh, tell some outperforms all of the baselines. Um, So here is the uh, uh, something called generalizability test, uh, which we tried to do. So basically um, just not, uh, the model is not inherently biased towards our um, uh, 24 season uh, or to some uh, season, especially of 24. Uh, we did this something called cross season experiment where we tried to train and validate on uh, all the season except one and try to uh, test on the, the one which is kept idle. So these are like test scores on that idle season. Uh, whereas cross series, meaning that the whole model is trained on 24 and uh, we try to predict scores on prison break. So uh, this is something sort of qualitative analysis uh, that represents a high level overview of tail sum prediction. The, Immediate below bar uh, represents the ground truth. So this is, let's say, time segment. And the green patches here uh, represents the like time interval. And this is like FA, 
and there's like fandom annotations. Uh, these intervals are obtained from uh, text synopsis, which can be obtained in fandom site. That's like fan based sites. Uh, and uh, this is H stands for human annotation. Uh, so yeah, so all these annotations are compared with the model prediction. So as you can see, here is the model predictions and corresponding to that, we have some incidents covered. Like uh, if you have seen 24, um, there are some events like uh, Joss is uh, getting captured in helicopter and uh, uh, Lisa confronts a Russian agent, as you can see here, and then um, Morris is attempting to console Nadia and a lot more. So yeah, so if you want to, if you have like, if you're getting an interest, so I urge you to go and watch the uh, 24. It is a very nice series. Yeah. So like, uh, so how can we extend our work, right? The potential direction. So starting with sports, uh, uh, auto extraction of highlights would be benefit a lot of users, right? Uh, lecture, seminars, meeting, uh, all those things. Uh, we can make some keynotes in both audio and video. And uh, next is like uh, making top stories from news channel. And finally, micro videos from 10 minutes video like reels and shorts. Uh, some downstream tasks like uh, as uh, 12 labs people are doing. So if you look one level down, aligning the video component, video content with the text counterpart, whether it's like long description or one word, uh, can help us in search that is fetching video based on its content similarity with human query, generate responses to question asked on a given video, and classify that is group videos based on some user asked queries. So yeah, so this is our paper. Uh, you can visit our this QR and. Uh, here I'll end my talk. Thank you everyone for making till here and being with me. And I'm ready for questions. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Aditya, for, for the great talk. And I guess the partner to as well. <laughs> um, let's see. There's a question about Ankush in the chat. Could you explain a bit more about how hierarchical summarization are being captured? how hierarchical summarizations are being captured. I couldn't get the question, like what hierarchical summarization means? Like, okay, so uh, I will just uh, say that uh, we have a hierarchical model that is actually uh, how it is hierarchical because of the low level information like frames and word tokens, we are uh, looking at a very high level things. Uh, so to in order to reach there, uh, we are first uh, condensing the information at the ground level, that is frame and token level, and then uh, we are uh, pushing it to uh, some other model to uh, uh, retrieve information out or uh, do things. Now, um, if you are looking for summarization, like what kind of labels you are using, as I said, we are using recap uh, that is there in the episode itself that as our label and uh, obviously not that raw form rather we smooth it out and then use it for our purpose uh, uh, uh am i able to answer your okay. question yeah yeah so I, I might have been a little confused when you mentioned hierarchical summarization so these are still like scene level summarizations right like between like 10 seconds and like 50 seconds type of deal mm -hmm. Not like so, from the beginning of the movie to the end of the movie or like the first half. So here uh, we are not um, breaking the movie into some scenes. Rather, uh, this is an episode and like the 40 minute episode, the whole thing will go into the model. And what the output is basically. Uh, so yeah, as, as, as we can see here, uh, the model is outputting uh, something called labels. Like if this shot is getting selected, for the final summary, right? Or this dialogue is getting selected or not. As per that, then we will stitch all those shots uh, and dialogue to make the final thing. So from this 40 minute episode, we are trying to extract a, a video that can be like eight to 10 minutes long. Great. Yeah. yeah I hope that asks the question, Ankush. 
Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, unless if there's no other question, um, yeah, if, if there's no other question, I guess we can conclude the webinar. Um, yeah, like if any questions, like they can reach out to me and yeah, okay. Does oh, the output sure. understanding of the time frames it is generated from? Uh, okay, so here uh, we are uh, adding something called time embedding and the outputs which we are getting, uh, it is uh, it is simple, the output, no time information is added with those outputs. Uh, we know what time those outputs are and in uh, uh, temporal order, we just teach them. Uh, it is not that they are also giving the time information. We just only pass the temporal information in the processing uh, so as to understand the order. Other than that, nowhere we are passing any time information. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. And thanks, everyone. If any, any questions, please reach out to me. Um, I, um, you can visit my profile or you can see the code like there you can uh, reach out to me there. Thank actually, you. Yeah, actually there's one final question from Carl. Yeah. Is the size of each segment or chunk a pre-configured length or context aware? It is like pre-configured length. Like the local story group you are asking, like, like uh, we have done an ablation uh, that you can see in the paper. Like, uh, uh, now to answer your question, that's actually a very great question, first of all, because uh, we first tried to do this uh, scene segmentation. Scene mm -hmm. segmentation meaning there are a lot of shots and uh, um, this scene is kind of like capturing the overall uh, uh, interactions, right? So we are not doing that. Uh, rather, we just take the 20 shots uh, as a group and whichever dialogues are falling in those time frame, we are just appending it. Great. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Adia, for, for concluding our webinar today. Um, very, very nice presentation, uh, interesting problem domain as well. Um, thanks, Draco, uh, for the first presentation. Thanks, Kevin Haran, for the, for giving your talk as well. Uh, or like, I think, very engaging session from attendees. Um, yeah, I'll be sure to uh, share the recording of this session on YouTube, probably within the next three or four weeks, so you can all rewatch it uh, and explore, you know, follow up in the more uh, some on some of the details that the speaker has presented during the session today. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, once again, like we will run this webinar session on a weekly basis. So if you follow yes, this is informative, yeah, uh, sign up for the upcoming session. And we have a lot more researchers talking about their work on multimodal and, and video. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to see upcoming work from, from all the speakers uh, who present today. Thanks everyone and uh, hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Bye.